thank you all for uh, coming out and listening to this lecture. As you may know, we had some technical difficulties, so we are re-recording a fresh version here for you today. Uh, I am Sandra Bosley, the Executive Director for Preservation of Historic Winchester, and I will be presenting Images and History of Architecture and Industry Along Winchester's Railroads. This talk will be covering post-Civil War railroads and industries in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, what we're going to do is highlight the progression of the industries that utilize the railroads and the buildings that house them through pictures and quotations covering, you know, basically 100 years from 1860 to about 1960. We'll have this broken down into three sections. Uh, we're going to start with uh, apparel and textile industries. Then we will cover groceries and especially apples here and those related industries before we finish up with a look at the crown jewels of architecture, the railroads buildings. At this point, we'll get started with Winchester's very earliest apparel related industry, which is tanning leather. After the Civil War, uh, people in Winchester we're looking for a way to generate income uh, with what little was left here after the destruction of the war. Winchester revisited one of the town's very first frontier industries, which was uh, processing leather, especially leather tanning. The innovation uh, in this post-Civil War era came from using a new tree, the sumac, which is basically a weed tree, to provide the tannins for the leather instead of what you'd more commonly think of uh, using the oak tree. Richmond newspapers reported a boom in the sumac industry in 1868, noting that although it was not a valuable crop, it was plentiful and very useful to the city tanners for making kid skin, which was uh, generally used for gloves and very supple leather, uh, also for shoes. And in addition to this, uh, they also could use the sumac for dyeing calicos uh, in drab or dove colors. The sheer volume of the sumac, the tree's ability to regrow after being harvested, and the very low startup cost led to sumac benefiting thousands of poor people in every section of the valley, affording opportunities to dispose of the branches of the sumac shrub that hitherto had been useless. German Smith pioneered sumac milling in Winchester and ran, ran many ads in the local newspapers uh, explaining how you harvest and dry the sumac properly before you would bring it to his mill, which would grind the bark. If you've seen some of the Winchester Little Theater history presentations lately, uh, you may recognize his building because it was basically the first permanent home of the Little Theater, and that is where they derive their name, the Bark Mill Players. This building is still standing on South Braddock Street. Today we'll use a lot of images from Sanborn maps, which were fire insurance maps, and it shows uh, the various areas inside of the building which were used for processing, packing, and storing the sumac. German Smith's mill would only grind up the dried twigs and leaves and package it for sale by the bag. It was up to the farmers to dry the sumac in an open but covered shed like this one. This is not an actual sumac shed from Winchester, but it is identical to how German Smith described uh, the optimal drying shed. You needed the shed to be covered from the sunlight to protect the sumac, but you also needed a lot of ventilation because the sumac could spontaneously combust if it was piled too deeply. In the mid-1880s, uh, U.S. forestry reports were showing that both black oak and sumac bark were being collected and exported along the railroads in Winchester. The bark 
uh, ground up as it was, would be used by the tanners for their leather, while the larger pieces of leftover wood, usually the oak, would be used in the nearby iron foundries. There were bark sheds close to the B&O lines on North Cameron Street, beside the freight house, and across the street from Snap Foundry. But as you can see, today those sheds are gone. So the question is, what happened to the sumac industry? In 1891, a man named George Wichelow in England patented the Dongola process to produce kid leather without needing the sumac for the tannins. Ten years later, the technology jumped the Atlantic and devastated the Virginia sumac trade. The same newspaper that had reported the boom now reported the bust. We are informed the sumac business has about run out. There is now a chemical improvement on the process. The consumption of sumac bark is now not one-tenth of what it was formerly. If you've seen a PHW presentation before, you have probably seen this factory too, so we'll cover this very briefly. To go along with the tanneries, Winchester was also the home to several leather glove manufacturers. Uh, this Greichen Glove Factory was located on North Cameron Street. It was established in 1852 or 1853 and at one time produced 225 styles of high-quality mittens and gloves in sheepskin, buckskin, goatskin, and calfskin, from fancy dress gloves to heavy worker gauntlets. This is one of William Greichen's own patents for a gauntlet glove, and you can see his signature in the lower corner. The glove factory had its own leather finishing facilities on the premises, in addition to uh, sewing and stock rooms. So it's very likely that they used Winchester sumac while they were uh, preparing their fancy kid leather gloves. Unfortunately, around 1961, the Italianate building and the neighboring Hart Hotel were demolished for some very modern style apartment complexes. Shifting from tanning into a weaving, Winchester's textile mills became very popular and important uh, at this perfect time, right about 1900, when a number of factors coalesced just perfectly. Steam-powered machinery had reduced the mill's dependence on running water sources to feed the mills, so they could be built wherever they could find, you know, the space and good transportation access. Uh, the two downtown mills here in Winchester were located side by side on North Kent Street, basically splitting uh, the B&O line between the two of them. The larger of the two was the Virginia Woolen Company. It was incorporated in 1900 and produced only wool goods. The raw wool was purchased from Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago, and the bolted fabric was shipped to New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. The factory produced top-of-the-line woolen material, which included Ford Motor Company upholstery in the early years, uh, later military uniforms, men's suits, and towards the very end, women's fashions as well. The mill was located approximately where the Timbrook Safety Building is today in Winchester. Now, even though the woolen mill was one of the largest employers in town, and it basically created the housing market for the east side of Winchester, it still had some handicaps in the lot size and water supply issues. And eventually the aging and outdated machinery also started to catch up with them. Really, the final nail in the coffin came, uh, like with the sumac industry, 
with the introduction of synthetic materials and the changes in consumer tastes. The woolen mill couldn't adapt to the competition from rayon and polyester and closed in the late 1950s. There was some hope that Winchester could reuse the buildings, uh, similar to the way that Martinsburg had done for some of their large buildings, to make it into an outlet store or to move in some other out-of-town interests into that building. Unfortunately, it was said that they were too far gone to repair, and even the iconic smokestack that had once dominated the eastern skyline was torn down in 1999. For a much more in-depth look at all the woolen mills in the Winchester area, I recommend you find a copy of Wilbur Johnston's book, Weaving a Common Thread. And you can still purchase this book at the Winchester Book Gallery in downtown Winchester. Just south of the Woolen Company was the Lewis Jones Knitting Mill. This building uh, was incorporated in 1895 and produced cotton knit goods, primarily ladies' underwear. It was the only cotton mill in Winchester and one of the few in the area. Industry reports in 1908 indicated consumers had a preference now for bleached cotton. One whole section of the Lewis Jones Mill was dedicated to bleaching the cotton. Like the woolen mill, the demand for workers was so great that the company would make it their business to procure suitable boarding houses for workers while they were learning the trade. In 1948, uh, the mill expanded into rayon, trying to capture some of these new technologies. But uh, eventually the company became just a piecing center instead of a weaving outlet. And then it became an outlet store in 1963. The building was sold about 10 years later and was used for various storage and assemblage functions. This building could have gone the way of the Virginia Woolen Company, taking the last vestiges of Winchester's textile industry with it. Luckily, this story has a happy ending. The rehabilitation of the Victorian-era building by Oakcrest was based around preserving the original brick and timber construction. Fraser Associates, the project architects, wove callbacks to the textile industry into the wall lighting that looks like bobbins, glass partitions and ironwork which are laid in grid-like patterns to recall the warp and weft of weaving. If you have not been on a tour of the building, you should stop in sometime and visit with Oakcrest and take a look at the very magnificent foyer that they have created for themselves. <music>